Welcome to Enterprise 218, the architect elevator. The cloud gives us amazing technical capabilities that allow us to give our tech stack a massive upgrade. But at the same time, shouldn't we be upgrading our architects or the role of an architect as well? I definitely think so, and I want to share today what I mean when I say upgrade the architects. My name is Gregor, I'm an enterprise strategist, and that means that I have spent most of my career leading transformations and leading cloud journeys. I've done that at major financial services and at the government of Singapore, and now I have the privilege of working with our major strategic customers, helping them on their cloud journey. Best part of the job is I meet a lot of interesting and smart people, so I learn a lot, and I like to write about what I learn about cloud and cloud strategy, and also about the role of architects and architecture, especially in a transformation scenario. Now, architecture is one of those words, right, where three people say architecture, they might be meaning three different things. And interestingly, in this case, they might all be right, because there are three different architectures that we need to talk about. The first one is the architecture in your system. Every system that you build will have a structure. You cannot build anything out of more than one part that does not have an architecture. So sometimes you hear people say, oh, we don't have time for architecture. And that means you still get an architecture, but you get one assigned to you because you didn't consciously choose. Um, Many of us know that that usually ends up being called the big ball of mud or the spaghetti architecture. That's sort of the default you get. So rather than that, you want to be doing architecture, right? You want to consciously choose the architecture that your system will have. And then somehow you need to also organize the people who do that. People who say, we need to speak to architecture. In that case, they mean the architecture team. Today I want to talk mostly about the bottom two because my experience is that choosing those very carefully actually has the biggest impact on your systems, getting the architecture that you intended and not the big ball of mud. So I've been an architect most of my career, sometimes by title, sometimes not. So it makes us wonder, what does it mean to be an architect? Right, it's something that's written on your business card or for some engineers is sort of a way to get a pay raise, right? If you get to be called architect, you somehow sound a little bit more important, right? I think obviously that is not the case. For me, being an architect is really a way of thinking. It's like a state of mind if we can use that word. And the first item that comes to mind when we think about what architects do is architects draw pictures. You know, some IT architects draw a lot of pictures and sometimes they're a little bit criticized for drawing too many pictures, but I think drawing pictures is actually extremely useful. We'll come to that later. However, when we think about sort of the pictures IT architects draw, we think sort of these complex IT landscape tapestries, right? That's what we think about, but that's not what famous building architects actually draw. Famous building architects, they draw sketches. So it's very famous, one of my, my favorite architects, Oscar Niemeyer, right? He was able to design the city of Brasilia when Brazil moved the capital um, out and basically created a brand new city, so massive project, and he was the key architect behind that. So here's the sketch that he made for the National Congress. And you might say, Mm, I kind of could have done that, but the short answer is probably you could not have. Because the essence of these sketches is that it takes all the noise and all the unimportant things away, and it captures the essence. It makes some very important decisions. It also incorporates the context and the function of the building. So this is a masterpiece of abstraction. It looks simple, but it incorporates all the critical, important decisions. And if you're worried that you know, this is sort of ivory tower kind of work and has little to do with reality, you can rest assured that you know, if you have better Photoshop skills, you can probably get this to align perfectly, that the building that was actually constructed very much matches the original sketch. 
and to the extent where this has become also the logo for the National Congress because it captures the essence of the system design. Side comment, Oscar Niemeyer also lived to be 105 years old, so being an architect apparently is a quite healthy profession. So I invite you all to come. I look forward, I look forward to many more years as an architect. So architects are not there to do the blueprints, right? There's many details here that are coming later, and those are also important, but the architects are there to make the key abstractions and the key decisions and to capture those. Second thing, as an architect, I find myself in a situation quite frequently where folks start arguing one way or the other. And they're sort of classic examples. So we need to accelerate the project schedule, but we need more time for testing. We don't want to compromise quality, right? You can see these discussions all the time where people have opposing views and they don't seem to find any common ground. It's just like the folks in this sketch. One person looks from here and says, this is a circle. And the other person says, I have no idea what you are talking about because this is a rectangle. And they will never find common ground. As an architect, one of the most powerful maneuvers you can do is that you can see more dimensions in this. Like in the sketch, right? You can see this is a cylinder. Hey, like, guys, you're looking at the same thing just from different perspectives and help people find common ground. For example, right, you can accelerate your project schedule and have equal or better quality. And the answer to that is automated testing, continuous integration, shift left, DevSecOps, right? We know many techniques that achieve that. So suddenly you can have a conversation that combines both viewpoints. That's a very powerful maneuver that architects can do to get out of these mental deadlocks because if you have only the one dimension, you will not find the common ground. And not only do we th see things from more dimensions, we also see things from different levels of abstraction. And in IT, when you zoom in, you see whole new different things. It's not like putting things in a photocopier and sending it to 200%, right? You get the same stuff a little bit bigger. No, our world is very much like these fractal worlds, like these Mandelbrot sets, where when you zoom in, you see very different things. So I do a lot of high-level strategy and architecture with our customers, but I also spend a lot of time with our serverless ecosystem and our serverless integration service, you know, Step Functions, Event Bridge, Lambda SQS. So that is a completely different world that I dive into, and it very much looks like that. And part of my task as an architect is bring insights back from the engine room that I dive into and have that contribute to making better decisions and having better strategies for my customers. And you see my guess, as you might guess, that has a lot to do with the architect elevator. And then the last item that I find is the sign of a poor architect is insisting on absolutes. When you find people who say, everything must be like this, and you can never do this. Everything must be loosely coupled, right? Everything must be in a container. These kind of everything statements, I find to be an indicator of not so great architects, because good architects see trade-offs. We always see shades of gray. I just gave a talk earlier about distributed systems, and we talked about coupling. Yeah, and people say, oh, it must be loosely coupled. It's like, no, that's not as easy. If it was that easy, you don't need an architect. It's all about shades of gray and nuances. So good architects will understand what trade-offs you're making and what the determinant is of where on this spectrum you should be. So for me, as being an architect, it's really seeing things that other people don't see, you know, capturing sketches, capturing the essence, being able to see more dimensions, being able to zoom in and zoom out, and also see more gradations, see more nuances, be better at making conscious trade-offs. And in the world we live in, you know, high levels of complexity, high levels of velocity, high levels of uncertainty, those are extremely important skills. And Correspondingly, I believe that architects play a massive role in a successful cloud journey, but also in an overall success of an organization. Interestingly, some folks come to me and say, well, this architect thing is all cute and sketches and dimensions and Mandelbrot sets, whatever you have there, but you know what? 
we are agile. And because we're agile, we don't actually need so much architecture. Now, I have a very different view on this, and I will prove to you why I don't believe that is correct. And here is the proof. As you can clearly see, here's the value of architecture. Well, all jokes aside, I come from the financial services industry, so this is the Black-Scholes formula of options pricing. Um, they got a Nobel Prize for economics for that, so not required reading for this class. But there's a very important lesson in here. Architects, when we design systems, we can provide options. What are options? Options are ways to defer decisions, right? And this comes out of the financial services industry very much. You know, if I'm wondering if I should buy a share of stock in some company today, well, maybe that's a difficult decision to make. You know, the markets are a little bit wild. You know, how do I decide? However, I can acquire an option to buy the stock in one year, let's say for $100. And that has an amazing property because when one year has passed, the purchasing decision has become trivial. If I hold an option to buy a share of stock for $100, if the stock trades for more than $100, I use my option and I have money in the bank. You know, consult your tax advisor for all the fine print, right? But basically, you have money in the bank. If for whatever reason the stock trades for less than $100 at the time, I do not use the option. It's optional. Right? So the decision has become trivial. What I have done, I have time traveled in a way. I, I fixed the parameter, right? The $100 I fixed, so I'm not losing my option. I'm not losing my ability to decide, but I deferred that decision into the future because in the future I'm much smarter. I no longer need to predict the stock price. I actually know the stock price. And that has value, right? As you can easily see, because you make better decisions and this is how that value is calculated. Now, what does this look like in IT? Like, how does an architect make an IT option? Well, let's take a notoriously difficult IT decision. And when I worked in large financial services, I often said the saddest team we had was the hardware sizing team. Whenever we bought or built some software, somebody had to go and figure out, well, how much capacity does it need? And the reason they were the saddest team is because they could only be wrong in one of two ways, right? Either you have too much hardware, right, and you wasted money, or you have too little hardware, and you get kicked later because the performance is no good. Um, it's also a test of how rich your organization is. You know, the wealthier the organization, the more likely they're going to buy more hardware. It's great for the vendors, not great for the end user. So that is obviously difficult, right? How big should this box be? So what's the option we can provide? Well, you're at reInvent, right? You're talking to AWS. So the option here is relatively well known. It's called a scale-out architecture and an elastic pay-as-you-go infrastructure. That's what the cloud gives you. And now this decision, you have the option to add or remove hardware, so your maneuverability for your decision is preserved, but you get to defer that decision until you actually know. If you need more hardware, you add, and if you need less hardware, you actually reduce the capacity. And that is one of those options, right? I can also give you the option to have different end-user devices. Does it have to be on mobile, on the web, on APIs? I can give you the option. I can give you options to use different programming languages for this, right? I can give you the option to migrate this to the cloud, right? These are all options I can give you so that you can make those decisions at the time that you have this kind of additional information. Now, if you watched very carefully, the previous slide said architects sell options. Right? I didn't say they donate them. And this is sometimes tough for architects because they say, well, I have all these great ideas, all these you know, great architectures, but people don't want them. And I said, well, part of the reason for that is that they're not always free. They have a cost, right? As, as much as we make it very easy to have scale-out architectures, there's still a few little things you need to do, right? There's load balancing, maybe you need to make things stateless and externalize the state, right? There's a little bit of effort. 
there's also some complexity, right? No matter which way you turn it, there's just a few more, using, uh, few more um, moving parts. And then the other thing is, depending what options you want to buy, you might also have underutilization. So for example, some folks like the option to run your workload in different clouds, right? Happens, reasonable, the option has value, mathematically proven, but the option also has a high cost. It has a cost of complexity, and the cost of underutilization, because you have all these fantastic cloud services, but then you say, oh, I can't use this one because you know, maybe I don't have it over there. And that underutilization carries a very high cost. Because if somebody else uses those services and builds something more successful in the market, right, you might never arrive at the situation where you need to move something. Right? You need to be successful first, so be careful about the trade-off that you make. So how do you decide, right? The options aren't exactly free, but they're very valuable. So when is it good to buy the option? And when is it not good to buy the option? And one of the key parameters in this, it was in the formula, right? I'm not going to go back. It was actually in the formula, is the level of uncertainty, right? The higher the level of uncertainty, the more valuable the options become. So Black Scholes got a Nobel Prize for that. For us, we have an easier way of making that plausible, right? If the future is very certain, if nothing ever changes, deferring a decision isn't that useful, right? Let's say I build my, my application and I build it just for myself. Like the scale will never change. I will always have one user. Do I need a scale out architecture? Probably not because I have no uncertainty. Do I build a mobile application? I might have 100 users, 1,000 users, 10,000 users, a million users, high levels of uncertainty. Absolutely, I do want that scale-out architecture. So uncertainty drives up the value of these options. And interestingly, we live in, live in very uncertain times. So the value of architecture and the value of architecture options and the value of the cloud enabling these kind of things has actually gone up quite a bit. So two thoughts to that. The first one is, I, um, in IT, there's sort of, um, how do I say, levels of bragging rights we try to get to. And one of the stages of having bragging rights is having your law, right? There's Conway's law, right, and other things, Murphy's law. So we should also have Gregor's law, right, my attempt. And Gregor's law is exactly around this trade-off, right? If you see uncertainty everywhere and you want all options all the time, I want this on any platform, with any front end, in any language, at any scale, right, in any market, with anything else, that sounds really nice, but ultimately you will drown in complexity. You gotta pluck a few things down. And we do see that with customers, right? It's like the folks who are able to make a decision and run with it tend to be much more successful than the one who sort of go around, but what if, what if, what if I need all these options? So that's insight number one. Insight number two, let's go back to this agile and architecture story. The folks who come to you and say, hey, I'm agile, I don't need this architecture thing. Well, what did we just learn about architecture? We learned that the higher the level of uncertainty, the more valuable the architecture is. You know, if I know everything and nothing ever changes, I probably just build it. I don't need a lot of architecture. So why are people agile? Well, people are agile because they deal with uncertainty. If I know everything and nothing ever changes, I also don't need to be agile. So if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'm agile, you know, the architecture thing is kind of cute, but it's not for me, you now have a very different response. The response is, it's great you're working in an agile way because that's a fantastic way of working, and, and the reason you're doing that is likely because you deal with uncertainty. And they will say, oh, yeah, yeah, lots of uncertainty, right? And you say, perfect, because that's also why we need architecture. Right? The higher the level of uncertainty, the more architecture you need. So there's absolutely no opposing element here. Both thrive on uncertainty. And I'm sort of somewhat known for having a lot of car metaphors, so there's also a car metaphor for this one, right? The agility is really the steering wheel, and the architecture is the engine and the gas pedal. The architecture keeps you moving, and the agility allows you to make turns. If you want to win a race, you probably want to have both. So now we have a different view on sort of the value that architecture brings, right? Ranging from 
you know, agility all the way to Black Scholes options pricing formula, but it gives you a very different view why architecture is so valuable. Now, let's apply that to architects. Well, which architect is most valuable? Well, I used to have a title of chief architect, would be easy to claim, like, well, that must be very valuable, it's like a chief architect, right? Versus other people would say, ah, oh, that's ivory tower, that's just drawing pictures, right? You don't make any real impact. It's not that valuable at all. It's the folks who like solve tough concurrency problems and get stuff running, right? Probably they're more valuable. And in a way, both are right because it's sort of asking the wrong question. To me, the most valuable architect is the person who can span the most levels. So if somebody is really up in the ivory tower just drawing picture, that's not that great. But if you're only in the engine room, right, you might be a great engineer, but it still doesn't bring value as an architect. It's the connection of the layers that brings the value. And there's sort of an intuitive and more structured explanation for that. The intuitive one is, right, if the two tunnels don't meet, if your business strategy and your architecture don't align, digging faster doesn't help if the tunnels don't meet. Right? All this, your great your hem charts, Kubernetes things you're doing down there, if that doesn't support your strategy, right, then it's wasted time. And people are always surprised how tight these connections really are. So yeah, I've worked insurance business. So what defines an insurance business strategy? Well, many different things you can do. You can enter new markets. You can enter new countries, right? Worked in a global organization. We do that. You can broaden your product portfolio. You can have life and health, auto insurance, you know, all the kind of uh, different things you have, right? Industrial business insurance, right? You can have more product lines. You can penetrate markets more deeply, new customer segments. You can bundle different products together, right? Those are classic business strategies. Interestingly, the architecture for a system that will support those strategies will look differently. But if I enter new markets, I need to be able to pull new instances up very easy. Cloud can help with that, right? But that is the conclusion. I need to be able to pull up systems for new markets or make them multi-tenant enough so that I can do that without new instances. If I want to have new product lines, I need a system that allows functional enhancements like whole new modules. If I want to have um, combined sales and bundle, I need to have integration capability, right? So this connection across the levels happens much more directly than people generally assume. And that's why if this connection is not there, you run into big trouble. And these are the classic situations where people say, well, why can't our technology with all the money and the great things we have, why can't it support what the business wants? And that's the easy answer is easy because the connection was just never made. But there's another way to show why the architects who connect the layers are the most valuable ones. And I can prove that with an architecture. So here's an architecture, a very simple architecture. We like sketches. So there's a sketch here in the middle, four blue boxes. And that's called a layered architecture. Right? We use that all the time. So why do we use layering so much? Because it has many nice benefits. Right? It has clean dependencies, you have neat interfaces, so what's inside the blue box is abstracted from the other pieces. You have replaceability because the linear dependencies, it's easy to take one thing out and put another one in, and one blue box does one thing well, so you have a nice separation of concerns, all stuff that we like as architects. But I already said shades of gray, right? trade-offs. Everything in architecture that has light also has shadow. So there will be some price to pay for this, right? There might be some overhead, right? If you need to get the systems connected, you need to build the white arrows, you need to find common data formats, maybe, you know, data has to be encoded a certain way and decoded a certain way. The whole thing sort of, if you have maybe 50 or 100 layers, you might have its own complexity. And the last two ones, I even, they, they sound more subtle, but they actually, um, the biggest problems is local optimization versus global optimization. You might run into a problem where each layer is highly optimized, but the whole system is not, and that is really bad. And the last one is change propagation, right? I used to work a lot with uh, system architectures. So you have a front end, a back end for front end, an API layer, a business logic layer, a persistence layer, and somebody wants to add one field to the screen. 
Well, you know exactly what's going to happen, right? But it's going to get added to the front end, the back end for front end, the API layer, business logic layer, and persistence layer, right? So you win some, you lose some. Now, as an architect, we're there to make decisions. So what shall we do? How many layers do we need? Now, the answer lies into the things on the left being different from the things on the right. It's a little bit sort of like an ink blot test. I know it's late in the day, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer. What somebody said is the things on the right are real. And I thought that was a very interesting description. The things on the left he thought were theoretical and the things on the right are real. And they were actually onto something. The advantages on the left are structural advantages. We talk about dependencies, abstractions, interfaces. The things on the right are dynamic in nature. Now you talk about latencies and, and change propagation, right? It's like the things on the right hint at movement versus the things on the left hint at structure. So you can see, aha, when things are slow moving, the structural benefits work well for me. If things are fast changing, the things on the right will weigh more heavily and will shift the balance. So now we come to a couple of very interesting insights. The first insight is none of what I have on this slide says whether this is a technical system or an organization. Right? It's like all these things, you know, local optimization we know very well. Right? Some department runs a really lean job, but you want to get anything done with them, you take a number and wait two weeks. Right? That's how lo what local optimization looks like. And uh, replaceability, whether we like it or not, that's called outsourcing. Right? That's taking one layer out and shifting another layer in. So this works equally well for organ or not well, depending on which way, right? for organizations and for technical systems. A yeah, common joke I have around this is, you know, we build you know, distributed systems. So if you want to build a high throughput system, the worst thing you can do to your system is synchronization points. Because you know, synchronization, like it comes out of Greek somewhere, basically it means clock, like it means some things wait for other things, right, in order to get them to synchronize. And that's the surest way to make sure your system does not have high throughput because obviously waiting isn't sort of the smartest thing to do. What in organizations, that's called a meeting, right? That's a synchronization point, right? And is also a great way to limit the throughput. So we learn that complex technical and organizational systems actually behave similarly. And that's why I tell a lot of technical architects, I'm like, you guys actually know a lot more about organizational architecture than you might have thought. When I worked in financial services, I always joked, I always said, I'm actually the chief organizational architect disguised as the chief IT architect. Because in the end, the two have to align. Now, coming back to our pluses and minuses on the left side and the right hand side. The reason organizations have so many layers is because they used to benefit from the things on the left, right? It's like I, as a developer, don't have to worry about the tax codes because the finance department will do that, or the HR department will make sure that the payroll runs, the separation of concerns and the structuring has worked well because the rate of change was low. Now the rate of change is going up. You don't need to look very far. Like everywhere around us, rate of change and uncertainty is going up, so organizations suffer more from the things on the right. It takes longer to make decisions. It takes longer to see opportunities. It takes longer to solve any issues that might come up. They're feeling the pinch from the things on the right. So they want fewer layers. The layers don't work as well for them anymore as they used to. And some years ago, there was a public consulting term. It was called delayering. The problem is, just like with a tall building, you can't just go and take a few floors out, right? Sounds good on paper, but doesn't work in reality, right? You'll just end up with a pile of rubble in either, either universe, right? In your organization or in, in the building. So if you can't just take layers out, what is the next best maneuver you can do? will have better vertical mobility, more elevators, faster elevators. And that is the architect elevator. The layering that used to work well for the organizations is now working against them because you know, it doesn't work in what I call the economies of speed, right? the things on the right way. So that's why you need more vertical um, mobility in the organization. You need the connecting element. Well, what does that look like? There's a 
whole book. You may read if you like it. But first thing I said, right, if the two tunnels don't meet, dig digging faster doesn't help. You got to make sure your business and IT strategy is aligned. I talked to so many IT leaders who have all these great ideas. And I said, you cannot succeed without the business in this. Right? Because if, if that is out of whack, all the great things you will do might become meaningless if it doesn't support what the business is after. And vice versa is also true. We'll come to that later. You will never be in the state that you want to be in. If you were in the perfect state today, the world around you will change, and tomorrow you will no longer be in a perfect state. So you will always be driving change. Right, so this morning I had a discussion with a customer. We talked about transformation and the dangers of seeing transformation as a project. It doesn't have an end point. It's not like, oh, now I'm transformed and I can lean back because I'm transformed. I'm now perfectly equipped for this new world. Unfortunately, that's not how it works because by the time you transform to this point, the world around you will have moved as well. So change is a constant element of riding the architect elevator. The biggest enemy of an architect riding this elevator, making this connection, is complexity. Yeah, let's be honest. We can do some pretty amazing stuff in IT. If you go sort of like 15, 20 years back, like everything that used to be very difficult, like get stuff deployed, have globally distributed databases, run in different countries around the world, all that used to be incredibly difficult, and we made that amazingly easy thanks to the cloud, but it's still complex. We're building complex systems. There's machine learning, there's automation, there's distributed systems. So complexity works against riding the architect elevator. I used to do, um, I used to teach architect workshops and one of the funnest exercise was for the architects to explain what container orchestration is and why it's important for the organization. And each team pulled a card for the target audience. The target audience was the chief marketing officer, the chief financial officer, the chief operating officer, right? So go explain to them what is container orchestration? Why is that something important for our organization? Was one of the funnest exercises, but that exactly hitting this, right? Confer complexity doesn't mean dumbing things down. You need to convey the trade-offs so your executives can be seeing the trade-offs that you're making, so you're setting the right expectations. So you can't just sort of do the, these are not the droids you're looking for maneuver, right? You gotta explain what it's about, but you gotta be able to demystify it. I have a few small samples of what that looks like, so let's write a tiny bit of architect elevator, and we're sort of riding from the top down. So I made a little bit fun of container orchestration, so we have similar things here, right? If we go into the engine room, you know, I spend a lot of time in the engine room, here is stuff that we find really exciting. Yeah, high levels of automation, automated deployments, high velocity, you know, high release cadence, observability, and reinvent is full of it, right? This is absolutely cool stuff. We love it. When you go talk to a CIO, the CIO will say, well, I have slightly different conversations with my boss. Right? When I talk to my boss, it's like, I don't want to be in a newspaper or data breach, because right? that's unhealthy for both of us. I don't want to pay for IT that's not running. And even if it's running, if I can pay a little bit less, that's also highly desired. Right? They have very different things about it. Now, the architect elevator is not about just speaking the things on the left and speaking the things on the right. The architect elevator is about making the connection. So how do you get a good security posture? Well, through patching, right? The easiest exploits is your old, old outdated version, right? It has a known exploits, right? That is sort of the dumbest way to get compromised. So you need automation. If something goes wrong or a vulnerability is discovered, you need velocity to quickly redeploy and fix it. And you need observability to understand if you're compromised. This is exactly, those are the ingredients into giving you a good security posture. Same thing about availability and cost, right? What is the most expensive way to get high availability? Warm standbys. You're paying sort of double the hardware for sort of half a percent of availability increase, right? Go explain that to the CFO, how that is a smart investment. 
If you have high levels of automation, observability, you understand your workloads, you can predict, you can deploy new instances very quickly because you have velocity, you can run much leaner and scale up and down as you need. And you get higher levels of availability at lower cost. You know, of course, the cloud allows you to do all these things, but the ways of working behind it are exactly the things on the left. So what we learn here is that the architect elevator is really about making this kind of connections and having the CIO understand that we're not talking about two different things. We're actually talking about the same things because the things on the left enable the things on the right. Now I mentioned complexity and complexity being sort of our biggest challenge and with this we're coming back to the sketches. The best tool we have to conquer complexity are models, abstractions, right? The reality is always awfully complex. In order to make decisions, we need to distill things down to the essence and have a model that helps us make those decisions. Now, there's always a question, what model should we choose? So here's a system you guys should be familiar with. It's called Planet Earth. If somebody isn't, let me know. And there's four different models. Which model is the best? Well, this is a trick question, because the best model depends on the problem you're looking to solve or the question you're looking to answer. If you want to go for a hike and you don't like steep hills, top left, topographical map, very good. If you want to build a ski resort, same thing, or you want to build a house outside the flood zone, or you want to build a dam, right? All perfect things for the top left. If you want to go drive from A to B, right, a road map is very good. If you're following the elections, right, a, a, a political map is extremely useful. And then the bottom right, that's a population density map, right? Some of us are also in the business of e-commerce and building distribution centers, right? Bottom right map, extremely useful for that, right? You build the distribution center where the people actually live by your products. So let's bring this back to IT architecture. Too often architects are asked, show me your architecture. And that's almost not such a meaningful question, right? As an architect, you're entitled to reply to this. I'd be happy to, but if I know what question you have or what decision you're looking to make, then I can give you the right architecture for that. Because the model's purpose is not to depict reality. I would say the worst pictures that IT produces are these giant enterprise architecture tapestries who try to show reality. They lack abstraction. A model isn't supposed to be reality. A model is abstraction. The highways are not actually red, and last time I hiked, I looked in vain for the, for the lines, right? Which elevation I'm at. That is not what it looks like. So the more you can abstract, the more powerful the model becomes. There's always a joke that the big tapestries do answer a few questions, and those generally are, why does everything take forever and take so long? But it's not a very actionable sort of outcome out of that model. So you need to know the question in order to have the right model, and that is the best tool you have to conquer the complexity down in the engine room and bring those decision trade-offs to a broader audience. And that also means sketches usually do this better than giant tapestries. Now, one more thing I mentioned in the beginning, right, when we said like thinking like an architect, one thing was seeing more dimensions. And I want to come back to that because there's some really important examples. When we work with customers on transformation, the customers often find themselves in a perceived bind between sort of seemingly opposing forces. Go talk to any CIO, right? It's very clear they want to standardize, harmonize, get diversity and complexity down. That's on any CIO's mandate. At the same time, the business is asking for more speed, flexibility, and innovation. And they're like, well, I'm between a rock and a hard place, right? Quality and speed, right? I need to speed up. I don't want to compromise quality. I want to customize, but I don't want to increase my expense. So one of the amazing things that 
the cloud and architects can do is actually show you that this is not on a single dimension. It's not left or right. You can actually have both things. Well, I give you easy examples for that. The cloud itself is a great example how you can be harmonized and have a high rate of innovation. I often say we have well over 200 services in production, but we essentially have a single product, right? AWS is AWS. There's one thing we have. So it's highly harmonized. There's not 50 different AWSs. But look at what it's done to the rate of innovation in IT. You can have all your workloads on a common platform and harmonize, have common cost management, the identity access control, and all the other systems operations management, right? It is harmonized as a platform, but it's been a huge innovation driver, right? And that's the magic of cloud platforms. Speed and quality, right? I already mentioned, you know, automation, you know, shifting left, testing early in the cycle and testing frequently allows you to have both. Machine learning models, right? We do this all the time, and our customers do it all the time. You can give each customer a personalized experience for pennies or even less. And with serverless, right, you can build things quickly, but they scale, and they scale to thousands or millions of requests. You no longer have to choose between quickly putting something together, but then having to throw it away and rebuilding it because it will not scale. So having this ability to break through this left or right, right, I can only have one or the other, is an extremely powerful maneuver that architects can make. And then the last one is going to be an interesting one coming from a vendor person especially. Too much architecture is mistaken for selecting the services. We love our services, they're all great, our customers love them, but your architecture is not Lambda, EventBridge, Step Functions, and SQS, right? That's the implementation, right? And they're fantastic, I work with them all the time. But as good architects, you need to capture the decisions, the intent of your design, the patterns. I'm a bit biased here, I wrote a whole book about this almost 20 years ago, right? But you need to capture what kind of system you're building, what decisions are you making, and what is the intent. And you know, without going into a serverless lecture here, right, one of my favorite services, EventBridge, relatively simple, you know, very self-contained event router, you can do many different things with this. You can filter events, you can transform events, you can send them to multiple destinations, and maintaining that kind of vocabulary, why are you using EventBridge, is a much more powerful maneuver than saying, I use EventBridge. So good architects don't just use the service vocabulary. Those are important for implementation. Good architects maintain the design intent and the design decisions that they're making. And tomorrow I'm actually giving a talk about that also shows you how working this way can reduce your switching costs. Right? We always talk about that. So thinking in patterns and thinking in design constructs actually does many things for you. And the way I always explain this, right, it's not just the ingredients. Having high quality ingredients is a good starting point, and we have very high quality ingredients, but it's about how it's put together, and that's where your job as an architect is. So, yeah, as I said, this is coming from a vendor. Don't just talk in the services, also talk in your higher level designs and architecture decisions. So that's all great. So now we understand a little bit sort of what the elevator looks like in an abridged version. Now we come to the third architecture, right? The we need to talk to architecture, right? Where do we put these architects and how are they structured? We like models. So I have a model. I have a sketch, a very simple model for this. And the property of these models is they don't give you an easy answer because there isn't sort of a predefined answer to difficult questions, right? It's not just like pick a number. What the models do, though, they give you intellectual rigor so you can come to a better decision yourself. And that's the power of those models. Like, you know your situation best. The model gives you a more structured way of thinking so you can come to a better decision. 
So here's four architecture models. The one is sort of the chief architect, right? I kind of used to be. I call this the benevolent dictator. Didn't quite make it past the copy editing. So yeah, the architect decides and the team implements, right? So a classic top down. I put a question exclamation mark in. It has some obvious weaknesses. And the biggest weakness is if there's no feedback loop. What if that person on top decides some things that actually don't make sense? I've seen this a lot, right? I had a, a system once, somebody came to me and says, oh, we built this software and it's really resource intensive. It, it's always funny that in big IT, using a lot of resources gives you bragging rights. That right? should be kind of the opposite. You should build lean things, right? But it was like, yeah, no, we, we built this really you know, intensive thing. And then we looked at it and we just like, how can this use so many resources? And then it turned out it was a distributed system and all the communication was done in XML. So basically 90% of the system was spent parsing XML and garbage collecting. I'm like, why would you do that architecture decision? Right? The architect had decided that whenever things communicate, that should be done in XML, right? And it, cost, it caused a huge cost downstream. So you need to have feedback here to know whether these decisions actually bring the benefit or whether they have a hidden cost, right, like they did in this case. Another model, right, architects in the team, so the primus inter pares and sort of neo-Latin, right, so they're with the team, but they're a bit of a special role. I've seen that work very successfully. Then there is the, we call it the architecture without architects, so model number three, where the architecture function is done in the team, but there are no people with the explicit title. So doing architecture is everybody's job. Very nice model. The danger is it's similar to model number four. Number four, the people who think everybody does it, but in reality, nobody does. Yeah, and the subtitle for that is uh, the inmates running the asylum. Also didn't make it past copy edit. So now we have a model. Right? And now that we have this model, you can have a more intelligent discussion about this. The one thing is, does this evolve over time? You know, architects see more dimensions. Where's the time dimension here? There is a time dimension. You probably start out on the left because you need to pick some direction somehow. And that is easier to do with a benevolent dictator model. But you know the shortcomings. The shortcomings is that person is not going to be able to keep up. They might become a bottleneck. They might lack feedback. So you're shifting to the right. But if you shift too far to number four, basically the only way to get back out is go all the way back to the left. Right? It's like Monopoly and you know, go back to start. Do not collect the $200. Right? So the model allows you to express the time dimension and it can also allows, it also allows you to express sort of maybe you have a mix in your organization. Maybe in some departments the left model is still good versus other ones have already moved to the right model. So there isn't a single easy answer how architecture should interact with the teams, but we have decision models that allow us to have intelligent decision making around this. A related model, one last model. When people sort of have the mental picture of architecture, it's usually a little bit like this thing on the left. They sort of the teams doing the work, and then the architecture kind of sits on top, right? It's like the, similar to the benevolent dictator in the previous picture, right? It's just kind of naturally, somehow architecture sounds more important, especially if it's enterprise architecture, so somehow that must be on the top. But that has some weaknesses, right? Especially the weakness of ivory tower and lack of feedback cycle. So when I build an architecture team in financial services, I was very keen to build an architecture team that I called vertical. I had architects ranging from strategic enterprise architecture down to network security architecture. Right? We could span many different levels. I had cloud architects, I had application architects, I had folks who did all the automation. We really covered all the different levels and we found that gives us a much better feedback cycle and a much better ability to operate because we can see things at all the different levels. It wasn't free, right? There's always a trade-off and there was it's harder to manage such a team. Right, whenever we talked about network security things, 
right? The enterprise architect complained a little bit. It's like, oh, this is not architecture. It's just like engineering work. And every time we did enterprise architecture, the engineers complained, oh, you're just drawing pictures, right? So, you know, it takes a little bit more effort to pull that team together, but I'd much rather have that challenge than have the team disconnected from the other parts of the organization. So in a way, I, I, didn't, I couldn't make the fundamental problem go away, but I could localize the problem into my team, and then I could manage it much more easily. So I became a big fan of building these, these vertical architecture team. Don't just be the layer, the layer at the top. So last part, though, we talked a lot about the engine room to the penthouse. Right? We talked about how you can connect the dots, how you can explain how the technology is relevant for strategic decision making. But of course, this can't be a one-way exercise. Right? The folks up in the, in the penthouse IT leadership also needs to ride the elevator down because IT plays a much bigger role in business these days. And in the past, it was sort of a little bit of a sign of a good leader to not get into the details. Right? So it's like, just do X, Y, Z, right? Here's your KPIs, here's your budget. You know, I don't care how you do this, I just want to see the results. Well, that's actually a very dangerous exercise. So here are some you know, great initiatives. Cut my costs down, get the workloads to the cloud. Yes, you should. Let's become agile. Yes, you should also. And let's not be a cost center. Let's be an innovation driver. All fantastic goals. What you might get, though, on the right-hand side, somebody reduces your cost by signing a multi-year rigid outsourcing contract. And now you want to do something interesting. It's like, ah, eh, well, either change order. I always say change order makes a sound. It's called catching, right? And you're going to go pay for that, right? That's not good. Or you're, or you're stuck. I had this example, I talked to an incoming CIO, and he says the worst thing I have is the previous CIO had bragged what a great outsourcing deal they got. So basically they saved on dollars, but in the process they sold all the options. Right? Remember the options, the ability to maneuver, they had sold those options in the process, and in an uncertain world, those options were much more valuable than the few dollars that they gained. It was a very Poor decision, I'm guessing that also contributed to that person being the outgoing CIO, all right? So this was a classic case, right? Move all the workloads, that's great, but if you lift and shift, I mean, there's some pretty nice things we can do, but really to get the benefit out of the cloud, you re-architect, you optimize, you increase your transparency, you make your applications finer grain, right? That's what you're really after. You want the agility, you want the elasticity, right? Don't, if you take everything you have and you put it exactly into the cloud, we always say you just get a nicer data center. Right now, data centers are very nice, but I haven't met an IT executive who is looking to have one more data center. So modernize, use the cloud for the capabilities that it brings. Yeah, and then we've, I'm sure many of you have seen these uh, you know, agile initiatives where it's basically relabeling exercise, all the project managers are now scrum masters. Right? And then they're surprised that magic things don't actually happen. So driving things from the outside in without looking into the engine room is whack-a-mole. Right? You say, do this, and you something else. The next mole just pops up, and it keeps hitting. So the idea of IT being a black box that you can sort of remote control, I find, doesn't work anymore at all. So what we learn is, you know, elevator from top down, as IT leaders, you got to be in touch with your engine room. And we do see this, see this with customers in many ways. The one way we see this, CIO reporting lines changing. It used to be that CIOs report to CFO, so IT is merely seen as a cost. And we see big changes to that, to, you know, CIO is now reporting up to the CEO, it being an equal part to anything else. And the reason for that is because the engine room, that's your future. Yeah, I've worked in a large insurance company, and sort of the punchy way we describe this is, we had 130 years, we're pretty smart, we're doing pretty well, so we can be pretty sure that any business model that doesn't rely on technology, we found. Come on, we had enough time, we're doing pretty well, we're pretty clever people. So you know, using that same logic, any new business models we can find will be technology enabled. 
And accordingly, the incoming CEO at the time, he actually sent all executives to technology training. And executives means like CFOs, COOs, right? Heads of HR, right? Not the IT folks, but everybody who said, technology is our future. I need everybody to have at least a basic understanding of the technology. So the engine room is no longer something that you outsource or somebody does for you. The engine room is something that the technical decisions made in the engine room will determine your future ability to maneuver. So you want to understand the decisions that are made in your engine room. And that also applies to business and technology strategy. Yes, technology is there to support the business, but technology also enables new business models. Classic examples have good trends. They work sort of in big manufacturing, big machinery, sort of power stations and train engines. Yeah, and one of the big business strategies those folks have is going from a product to a service model. So rather than you know, selling a generator, they basically sell kilowatt hours. Or rather than selling a train engine, they will sell passenger kilometers, right? Like great business strategy, but without IoT, predictive maintenance, analytics, cloud, that business strategy wouldn't make any sense, right? Because if the train engine isn't running now, that's on you because you're not producing passenger kilometers. So you got to know what your equipment is doing, right? I always say, if that wasn't technology dependent, we would have done that 20 years ago. So those are examples where IT strategy enables a business strategy. That business strategy would not be viable if we didn't have the technical capabilities. So now this has become a two-way street. They're both critically important. One cannot really exist without the other. So hopefully you enjoyed and different view on what it means to be an architect and having architecture, right, from sketching and dimensions and Mandelbrot sets zooming in and out, seeing shades of gray, and you can convince people that architecture has value because it sells options and Black Scholes have proven that that has value. And you can have seen that how we can connect the levels that that actually has the highest value because you got to be in touch with the engine room because that technical decisions are the foundation of the future success of your business. So with that, I invite you to enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you so much.